Welcome to a Classical Classroom Research Presentation. Today, Classical Music Rivalries. Kurt Cobain of the band Nirvana died tragically in 1994, which was about 20 years ago this April. But you know what hasn't died? The bristly feelings between Courtney Love, Cobain's widow, and the surviving Nirvana band members Dave Grohl and Chris Novoselic. They have been duking it out over music rights and money and something to do with a box set of Nirvana's work since Kurt died. And the loving feelings have never waned. In an interview in August of last year, Love called Grohl, quote, an asshole. In Great Britain, the bands Blur and Oasis have finally put a decades-long dispute to rest by performing together. The Blur vs. Oasis feud was so epic that one reporter compared this performance to the musical world's equivalent of signing a Middle East peace accord. Rappers Tupac and Biggie had a rivalry so intense that it eventually resulted in both of them being murdered. But long before Britney Spears and Justin Timberlake had a public display of breakup, or before Taylor Swift and Carrie Underwood had a public hate off, long before any of these rivalries began, Beethoven slighted Rossini. Back in the early 1800s, Italian opera was the jam, and Rossini was all the rage. Turns out, Beethoven, not so much a fan. Rossini met Beethoven, who by that point was deaf, in 1822. And Beethoven talked to Rossini in writing, I think he was writing on a napkin or something, he said, Ah, Rossini, so you're the composer of the Barber of Seville. I congratulate you. It will be played as long as Italian opera exists. Never try to write anything else but opera buffa. Any other style would do violence to your nature. Meow. But in fact, Beethoven was actually kind of fascinated by the rise of the popularity of Italian opera. And he included elements of it in some of his later instrumental work. One writer noted that he seemed to be paying half-ironic, half-sincere tribute to the popular music of his day in these works. Mozart and composer Antonio Salieri had a rivalry of story-worthy proportions, literally. Everybody from Alexander Pushkin to Milos Forman to The Simpsons have retold their tale, giving it official mythological status. Basically, it went down like this. Mozart moved to Vienna in the 1780s to work. According to letters he sent to his father, roving gangs of Italian composers were taking all of the jobs and blocking him from getting anywhere, especially the Salieri guy, who he claimed the emperor adored. Later on, things seemed to have changed between them. They even composed work together. Although, apparently Salieri said he'd rather chop his fingers off than work with Mozart again after their first opera. But when Mozart died, rumors flew that Salieri poisoned him. Years later, when Salieri was delusional and in the hospital, many accounts say that Salieri confessed to committing the crime. Though there's no evidence to support this, there's not a lot of evidence to support any one cause of death for Mozart. So. You decide. P.S. We have a short on Mozart's death if you want to check it out. Franz Strauss, father of Richard, detested Wagner. Franz was a horn player in the Bavarian court orchestra, and apparently a very gifted one. Franz was a huge fan of classical music, that is, music from the classical period, and especially of Mozart he really disliked modern music. Unfortunately, King Ludwig II dug the music of this new upstart, Richard Wagner. So the court orchestra began to play a lot of Wagner's work. And I mean a lot. Franz's professionalism meant that he practiced hard and mastered the horn solos in Wagner's works despite his personal distaste. He played at the premieres of Das Rheingold, Die Valkyrie, and Parsifal, and a whole lot more. Wagner, for his part, seemed to have been kind of bemused at Strauss's distaste for his music, although he very much respected Strauss's talent. One day, when Wagner was passing Strauss in the hallway, he said, Always gloomy, these horn players. To which Strauss said, We have a good reason to be. 
Strauss maintained a modicum of composure about the whole situation until one day, after practicing for seven hours on the 27th day of rehearsal of Die Meistersinger, he simply said he wasn't going to play anymore. So the conductor said, then take your pension. Basically, he was saying, get your check and get the hell out. And when Strauss said, fine, and did so, the guy who handed out the checks talked Strauss down from the ledge. And Strauss continued to play. I'm going to bet that he wasn't happy about it, though. Composers John Cage and Pierre Boulez met in Paris in the late 1940s, and they began a correspondence after that that lasted for years. They actually started out as friends, and they shared a philosophy that music shouldn't be subjectively creative, it shouldn't be about the composer, and that it shouldn't be tied to tradition. But they have very different creative approaches. Boulez created something called Integral serialism, which he developed from Schoenberg's 12-tone method, basically he used a formula to create his music, while Cage relied on chance. Cage would compose by following smudges on the notation paper, or coin flips, or by consulting the I Ching. So they used totally different methods of composing, but for the same reason. Cage even promoted Boulez's work in the US, and Boulez did the same for him in Paris. But in 1952, Boulez came to New York and spent some time with Cage. After their visit, Boulez decided that their ideas were not compatible. And because of that, they were not compatible. Boulez even began to openly criticize Cage, saying in an interview that Cage had adopted a philosophy tinged with Orientalism that masks a basic weakness in compositional technique. And then at one point he told Cage, Tales I'll speak to you, heads I won't ever again. Ouch. In 2009, famous Chinese pianist Long Long asked his label Deutsche Grammophon to drop fellow pianist Yun Di Li. And Deutsche Grammophon did. Lee's career was greatly damaged by Long's move. The pianists are only four months apart in age, but their styles are really different. Long is very flamboyant, he throws his head back when he plays, while Lee is a little more restrained. Their fans debate on social media which pianist is better. And Lee has since rejoined Deutsche Grammophon after Long left. And last year he said, this, this whole rivalry, was created by the media. We're both classical pianists, the same age, from the East, so it was an easy target to pit me against him for headlines. But it has nothing to do with me, no hostility between us whatsoever. I tell my fans to never be jealous, be a good man and work hard, as it's what I believe. People just assume what they've read is true. The reality is, I'd shake his hand if he were here. That's nice, Yundi. But I'm wondering if that amicability is one-sided, because Long also wouldn't perform with orchestras if they'd hired Lee within the same year. Interestingly, in 2008, a reviewer suggested that Lee was trying to emulate Long, playing show-offy virtuosic pieces at his shows. The title of this article was, Maybe the Rivalry Got to Him. What's fascinating about all of this to me is all of the work that's come out of it. Rivalry maybe even more than more typical sources of inspiration, like love or the weather or God, seems to spark a very particular passion in creators. It goads them to make new stuff. I mean, think about it. Beethoven commented sarcastically on Italian opera in his work and therefore made new work. Salieri and Mozart competed musically for the attention of the emperor, and who knows how much work came out of that rivalry, not to mention the movies, plays, operas, and TV shows that came out of their story. Franz Strauss couldn't stand Wagner, but he became so masterful at playing Wagner's work that when he tried to quit his job, the orchestra literally wouldn't let him. And surely Franz's experience as a musician and his opinions about modern music also affected his son, Ricard, who became one of the most famous composers of all time. The tension between Boulez and Cage led to not only new creations, but propelled them in opposite creative directions, directions that might not have existed had they never come to dislike each other. 
The competition between Long Long and Yoon Dee Lee has clearly egged both of them to fame. Tupac wrote about Biggie and his music in songs like Hit Him Up, and Dave Grohl has written several songs about Courtney Love and that whole thing. Songs like Let It Die and I'll Stick Around come to mind. It makes you wonder how much of the music out there was written not for something or someone, but against it. The takeaway? Negativity. Great for creativity. Special thanks to intern Daniel Webbin for his ideas and research on this episode. If you have a burning question that you'd like to have addressed on the Classical Classroom, feel free to send me an email at dclay at classical917.org. If you want to hear past episodes or see what's coming up on this show, go to classical917.org backslash classroom. Oh, and my New Year's resolution is to go to more classical music shows. If you would like for me to come to yours, go to our website, that's classical917.org backslash classroom, and you can see instructions for how to make your appeal. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time.